Hello class, I would have said good to see you, but clearly I can't. Anyway, we have a few minutes together. We want to have a look at stuff that's going on in the Navy, things that affect how you are going to be sailors when you pass out into the big Navy. First job, strange question maybe, where are you from? Obviously, I can't hear your answers, but where you're from, what about the people you grew up with? What about the school you went to, the area that you grew up with? Well, there's a strange kind of importance to this. We're going to go and have investigate what that actually means. Where you grew up actually affects the stuff that makes you you. And we come from different places. As I may have said to you, I come from Bradford, the guy from the local chip shop also comes from Bradford. We've got something in common. You come from all over the country, Colchester. Bradford, Newcastle, Carlisle, Penzance, Glasgow, Inverness, Belfast. And you come with different expectations of what life's about. But now you're in the Navy, we need to be a team. And we need to have something that holds us together. And that something is C2 drill. Courage, commitment, discipline, respect, integrity and loyalty. We're going to examine each one of these in turn over the next few minutes and see where they play into how you are as a sailor what holds us together first one is of course courage those of you who have been into the church of england church will see that picture hanging on the wall that's the boy cornwell who got a victoria cross uh, posthumously as it happens after the battle of jutland he remained at his post while the ship was under fire and everyone else on the upper deck was dying opposite him in the church if you go in you'll see kate nesbitt also hanging on the wall an MA from the more recent Afghanistan campaign. And she ran across a field of machine gun fire to render first aid to someone who had been hit. They both displayed courage. But what makes it courage? Well, if you're not frightened in those situations, if there's not a risk, then it's not courage. You're a robot. If you're happy to run across a field of machine gun fire with no emotion, then that just makes you a robot. So courage is something you display in the face of a risk, in the face of something you are frightened of the consequences. And clearly these two are both physical courage. You're sat there in uniform. We're expecting you to be able to display physical courage, particularly in conflict or something like that. But there are other forms of courage. It might be in your time in the Navy, you have to display something more like a moral courage. You might have to explain to an officer or a senior aide they've done something wrong. Or maybe you'll have to say something to an, an oppo on a mess deck that you disagree with what they're doing. In each case, there's a risk. You might be reprimanded by the officer or you might lose a friend if you confront your oppo. And if the rest of the mess agree with your friend, then you could find yourself very lonely. And on a nine month deployment, that could be really horrible. So you display courage in the face of something that's a risk, something you might be frightened of. So where does courage go wrong? Well, clearly a lack of courage is cowardice. But actually, courage goes wrong in a number of other ways as well. Sometimes you can display too much courage. That sounds a bit bizarre. But actually, think about being down Union Street on a Friday night. Not in lockdown, obviously. Come out of the pub, there's a girl you want to impress. And the building opposite is covered in scaffolding. You know what's coming next, don't you? And it is courage, but it's a misplaced courage. It's a courage that's gone wrong. It's foolhardiness. It's recklessness. And so where courage goes wrong might not be a lack of courage. It might very well be too much or misplaced courage. Let's move on. OK, if you are Irish, you'll get the joke, or if you've seen the film, you'll get the joke. Okay, commitment. Clearly, we want you to be committed to start or to continue that which you start in the Navy. We're going to have a look at some people you may recognize if you're as old as I am, and their commitment. What would you rather 
rather be doing, Atkinson? Well, to be quite honest, Sarge, I'd rather be home with the wife and kids. Would you now? Yes, Sarge. Right, off you go. Now, everybody else happy with my little plan of marching up and down the square a bit? Sarge? Yes. I've got a book I'd quite like to read. Right, you go read your book then. Now. Everybody else quite content to join in with my little scheme of marching up and down the square? Sarge? Yes, Wycliffe, what is it? Well, I'm uh, learning the piano. Learning the piano? Yes, Sarge. And I suppose you want to go and practice, eh? Marching up and down the square, not good enough for you, eh? Well, right, off you go! Now, what about the rest of you? Rather be at the pictures, I suppose. All right, off you go! Bloody army I don't know what it's coming to! Right, Sergeant Major marching up and down the square! Left, right! Okay, they didn't show any commitment, did they? And we need you to be committed to finish that which you started. But again, commitment can go wrong, not just for lack of commitment, but maybe misplaced commitment. Are you getting your priorities right when it comes to your career and your family? And you can't fault a kamikaze pilot or an ISIS bomber for their lack of commitment, can you? But it's a total misplaced commitment. Let's move on to discipline. Yes, people who are actually marching up and down the square. But it's a bit easier than, or easier than that to see when discipline is in action. It's not just the marching, it's when you're, you're resisting, scratching your nose when you're on parade. But more than that, it's how you look after yourself. You see, you can only display discipline if you have some self-discipline. So the discipline you display in the Navy when you follow orders is rooted in how you look after yourself. The discipline to feed yourself, dress yourself, look after yourself. And that's just as important. Again, we don't give you this stuff. You come with it. Ah, respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Find out what it means to us. Okay, who sang the song? All right, anyone who said Jackson 5 down and 10 press ups, it was, of course, Aretha Franklin. And yes, it's a little bit hippie what I've put there, but it really means we have to look after each other, whatever we believe, whatever our world outlook is. It's to look after each other, respect someone else who might have a different outlook from you. But this stuff isn't pink and fluffy. Everything about C2 Drill has an operational imperative. Where is the Ford operating base of the Royal Navy? Well it's Bahrain and it's vitally important that you can take the attribute of respect when you go to Bahrain because it's a very different culture and girls in particular when it's hot there you might find you need to cover up more than you would need to or want to back in the UK. We need to show respect in Bahrain to the local culture because we need to keep the sovereign naval base we've got there, our forward operating base. We need that base so we can operate in the Gulf. We need to be able to operate in the Gulf so we can guard the Straits for Hormuz. We need to guard the Straits for Hormuz so the oil can get through. We need the oil to get through so we can run our economy and our cars. Different question about whether cars should be running on oil, but without the Straits of Hormuz, our own economy would collapse. Without us being able to patrol the Gulf, we wouldn't be able to look after the Straits for us. Without the naval base in Bahrain, we wouldn't be able to patrol and our economy would be in dire jeopardy. Without you behaving yourselves and showing respect to the local community, we wouldn't have that naval base there. This stuff isn't pink and fluffy. This is strategic. This is global stuff. When you go to Bahrain, you can't go out on a Friday night, get pissed, and go and shaggle the prostitutes. Leave that to the Saudis. They're richer than we are. Also, 
respect has other operational imperatives. Back in the days of the Afghanistan campaign, we and the Americans were doing the same stuff, going out into the valleys to try and get intelligence on the Taliban. The Americans would turn up in their dreadful Humvees and just blat up the valleys doing their own thing. We would turn up in our wonderful Land Rovers, stop at the outskirts of each village, call out the headman, explain what we were trying to do, and by the way, can we rebuild your school? Who do you think got the better intelligence? Well, of course it was us. We were showing respect for the fact that we were not in our own country. This was someone else's land, and we were able to profit from that. Integrity. Integrity is a strange one. Integrity is a lot about honesty, but it's to do with doing the right thing when no one's looking. One of my colleagues used to give a similar talk to this, and he would say something like, well, if you're following someone down the road and they drop a £10 note, you can either act with integrity, give the £10 note back to them, or not, put it in your pocket. And if you put it in your pocket, no one's going to know. So it's doing the right thing when no one is looking. But the reason for the Oscar there is integrity actually means being the same on the inside as on the outside. Some of you may know of the actress Glenda Jackson, and quite a number of years ago she won an Oscar and she took it home, and her mum polished and polished and polished it because she was so proud that little Glenda got an Oscar. But she polished it so much that all the gold came off the outside, and all that was left in the middle was the base metal. The Oscar has no integrity, it's not the same on the outside as the inside. One of you here might end up getting the captain's prize and medal when you pass out. You'll be the person who marches so beautifully, it's like a metronome. When you do your kit, you iron your creases so sharp you can shave with them. You don't need to walk around with the lights on at night because your shoes are so bold, they glow. And when you salute, you can hear the air crack. But if you're also the mess deck bully, that's not integrity, is it? So being, showing integrity is something that isn't just a nice thing to do, picking up other people's £10 notes. It is also something operational as well. It helps the team to work. And finally, loyalty. Clearly, we need you to be loyal to each other, to the Royal Navy, to your unit. But you're always loyal in spite of a better offer. I'm going to show you someone who may or may not have been showing loyalty to his friend. You might recognise this from Red Dwarf. Okay, there's Cat not showing loyalty to his friend Lister. He's taken advantage of the better offer, which was actually to eat his fish. Now, sometimes the better offer will come quite subtly to you, and it could very well be a security risk. If you run up a huge debt of some description, our security services will take an interest and come to see you about that debt, because it's a security risk, because your loyalty could be in doubt. If you find yourself with a huge debt, then you're abroad, or someone from another country can come and say, how about sorting out that debt? I'm willing to pay that off for you, if maybe you'll do something for me, take a photograph of the inside of the ship. It happens. Don't think Mr Putin doesn't know every detail of your own bank account. Not all the time, of course, but he can say, I tell you what, come to me, minion, Find me all the details of Chaplin Alcock's bank account. Now go and get yourself shot. And he will be able to look at my bank account and see if I'm vulnerable to being bribed or blackmailed and my loyalty being tested. It's not just money that tests your loyalty. When I first joined the Navy, 
I was almost tricked. I joined the Navy and I went to Faz Lane and a woman wanted some pastoral care and I went to see her and at the end of our time together she came on to me. She was trying to get some sort of leverage on me for me to betray my loyalty, not just to the Navy, but also to my family as well. So loyalty can be tested and it's the way in that makes it a huge security risk if you have something that you can be bargained for, for your loyalty. Okay, gonna show you a couple of words now. What's the difference between those two words? And don't say one's got an E on the end. Moral and morale. Well, they often get mixed up, but they mean very different things. Moral is something to do with right and wrong, isn't it? Whereas morale is something to do with how happy you are. And you'd be amazed how many people, even the Navy, mix those up. I'm not the only chaplain who's gone along to my joining call with a captain on a ship and oh, you're jolly good to have the chaplain on board. All captains talk like that, especially the girls. You know, jolly good to have the chaplain on board. You're in charge of the morale component of the fighting force. No. Not the happiness officer. There's even a fairly senior officer on the base here who got that wrong a few weeks ago. Okay, we might come round as chaplains and hand out sweeties on occasion. And just so you know, if we hand you a sweetie, there's no a reciprocal arrangement. We might want to see you smile, cheer you up a bit, but we're not really in charge of your morale. We might be able to help you make the right decisions though, and something to do with the morals. But there is a link between the two words. And this link you find in a book no one ever reads, British Military Doctrine, which is a shame because we have the best military doctrine in the world. And it says, the moral components of fighting power is about persuading our people of their what? Does it get better? It depends on good moral derbidum. Um, um, actually, it does mean something really quite significant. And if you take out the long sentences and put it in simple words that stupid people like me can understand, basically what it's saying is you will be happier, have the morale, to go and do undertake any particular task, and that could include combat, if you believe we're doing the right thing, if it is moral. That's what it means. You're going to be happier to go, or more prepared, to go and undertake any particular task if you're content you're doing the right thing. Okay, who had the conversation with friends and family before coming here that they're going to give you a uniform, give you a gun, you might have to kill someone? Well, you have to have an under understanding that when you join the British Armed Forces, you're joining a force for good. If you don't have that understanding, you can't really be here. You can't be in the UK Armed Forces. And that includes my branch as well. You must have an understanding that when you join the UK Armed Forces, you're joining a force for good. Now, those of you who know your history, particularly your colonial history or your Irish history, will know that there are things our predecessors have done which will make your toes curl. But you must, at the moment at least, have an understanding that you're joining a force for good. Otherwise, you can't really be part of this. A number of years ago, there was a head scratch by a famous theologian. That's someone who looks at the Bible, really. Okay, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Aquinas. And he started reading the Bible. Always a good plan. But he got to a bit that puzzled him. He got to... Exodus chapter 20, which just happens to fall open on my Bible there. And you all know that Exodus chapter 20 contains... Everyone knows Exodus chapter 20 has got the Ten Commandments. Of course, yes, it was on the tip of your tongue. And he got as far as reading the Ten Commandments, and he got to verse 13 in the chapter, and it said something about not killing. Mm. And he had a bit of a head scratch because at the time he was reading the Bible, everyone in Europe was killing each other. And if you read the rest of the Old Testament, 
everyone kills each other. And he goes, well, that can't be right. And he had a head scratch and he developed something we now know as just war theory. When it is right to go to war, there must be certain conditions. Is it self-defense? Is it the last resort? Is the prospect of winning? And how do you treat non-competence and many other things like that. And that still forms the basis of our foreign policy and that of many countries around the world. Now it's well above our pay grade, but we do have a part to play. If we have a part to play, first of all, we have to understand that it is right to be in the UK armed forces because we're a force for good. But also we have to understand that when we go into war, what we do as our individual actions must be right. There must be something of a moral compass showing that what we do is right. And so that is C2 drill. How are we sure we're doing the right thing? see how these Russians deal with a crack SS division. Hans. Have courage, my friend. Yeah. Uh, Hans, I've just noticed something. These communists are all cowards. <laughs> Have you looked at our caps recently? Our caps? The badges on our caps. Have you looked at them? What? No. A bit? They've got skulls on them. <laughs> have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? I don't, sir. Uh... Hands. Are we the baddies? <laughs> okay. We have to be sure we're not the baddies. And that's partly what we're doing here. Measuring our own actions by C2 drill and those of our superiors as well. Not just to do with, are they showing courage, but are the decisions being made with integrity? But we must always show integrity and courage and commitment, discipline, respect, and loyalty as well. We must always follow the orders we've given, but we must measure our own performance. Do you think we're always right? Well, I want you to have a look at something. I want you to have a look at a picture Anyone seen that picture before? Well, that's a place called Abu Ghraib. It's from the Second Iraq War. And that is a detention center being run by the American Marine Corps. Now, a detention center means that the people who are being held there in prison are not actually prisoners. They're not criminals. They've not been convicted of anything. They're also not prisoners of war. These are people who have been brought in off the street, civilians. They're not combatants. And the Americans decided that there was enough evidence against them to suggest they were part of the insurgency and they needed to be locked up. But what's going on here? This isn't any ordinary prison, is it? In fact, if you look at the photograph, it's chopped just by the man's torso there as actually he's naked and the photograph is chopped to preserve his dignity. He's on a dog leash and the woman holding the dog leash is called Lindy England. She was a United States Marines reservist. And if you look up Abu Ghraib on the internet or anywhere, you'll see many pictures like this. The inmates are stood naked and Lindy England is laughing at their genitals. They have electrodes, place where you don't want electrodes. They're in torture positions. They're being sleep deprived. In fact, what happened in this location were the worst war crimes this century. And in many of the pictures, you'll see Lindy England taking part, apparently enjoying what she's doing to the inmates, to the detainees. What's wrong with her? Well, the scary thing is, there's nothing wrong with her. If you think that won't ever be you, then it will be you. I'll say that again. If you think that won't ever be you, it will be you. You see, she's not a bad person. Something went wrong that caused her to become like that. Now, she was court-martialed and she got four years and she's now out of the Marines and has 
a baby. But what went wrong there? Anyone heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment? A number of years ago, an American psychology professor by the name of Zimbardo, I had the opportunity to meet him, but I blew it because I'm stupid, okay? He wondered what would happen if you randomly gave people power. And he devised an experiment. Remember, everyone involved is a, is a volunteer. He devised an experiment where people come in and he would divide them between being prisoners and prison guards. A load of students off the campus came in and he divided them. You lot are prisoners, you lot are prison guards. You prisoners must wear prison clothing. You prison guards can wear sunglasses, now get stuck in. And within a matter of hours, those who were told they were prison guards were brutalizing those who were prisoners. And the experiment went on for several days, but was cut short when Zimbardo's then girlfriend, now wife, walked in and said, what the hell are you doing to these people? Good people go bad when the boundaries are moved, when the moral compass starts to flip. So what do you think happened in this particular place that caused the worst war crimes this century to happen? What was the first thing to go wrong? Well, astonishingly, it was just a matter of kit. They stopped doing their kit, they stopped cleaning their boots, they stopped wearing their uniform properly, they stopped giving marks of respect to their superiors. All the embuggeration we give you within the first three days of coming here, and you think it's just military old nonsense, but it actually keeps your moral compass in the right direction and helps to prevent that sort of atrocity from happening. After the second war, people from various psychology departments around the world went into Germany to try and find out why the Germans were so stupid to believe fascism. And they came back and said, there's nothing wrong with the German people. This could happen to anyone. And recent events in the United States have suggested it could happen very close to home. Good people can go bad. And you need to keep your moral compass straight up. It could be a lapse in C2 drill that seems to be really insignificant, a little bit of discipline. Nah, I'm not going to bother cleaning my kit or I'm not going to bother saluting that officer will be the start of a slippery slope to something that could be a disaster. This is a real life thing that happened in the second Iraq war and people really got hurt. If this were a live lesson, I would now show you a clip from the drama Making Waves, where there's a fire in the engine room. And I'd ask you to pick out people showing courage, commitment, discipline, respect, integrity, and loyalty, and those who fail to do so. Unfortunately, we haven't got time and we can do, not do this in this format. But look at your own actions, where you do show courage, commitment, discipline, respect, integrity, and loyalty, and where actually they fall down a bit. And possible consequences. People actually get hurt if you don't actually have C2 drill and follow it. And that's in both peacetime and wartime. I'm going to wrap up. I'm sure you're pleased about that. And hopefully you'll have a chance to stand easy at some point. But we'll come back to where we started. You come from different places. You come with different expectations. Something has to hold us together as a Navy, a team in the Navy. And that's what C2 drill does. First of all, we don't give it to you, you come with it. And we just get you to reflect on it and apply it in how you're in the Navy. Secondly, it's not pink and fluffy. This stuff has real operational imperatives about it, out in the field or whenever you're at home. This isn't so an add-on, this is as key and as core to you being in the military as being able to handle a gun. And if you don't look after your core values, if you don't constantly put yourself up against this standard, there can be tragedy, as we saw in Abu Ghraib and at many, many other real life situations in both peace and war. OK, well, that's me for the time being. Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to discuss this in more depth at some point, And I shall now hand you back to your divisional staff. Thank you very much and have a good morning.